uh, and oil. Uh, Rockefeller gets into the oil business uh, when it, there is no oil business, basically. It's just people pumping oil out of the patch in their backyard and selling barrels of it for lantern oil. Uh, right? Turns out uh, we killed all the whales off the coast of uh, New England, so we need somewhere else to get lantern oil. The ground it, it, it is, right? Uh, and so uh, what happens then is the discovery of the internal combustion engine, the idea that you could burn oil to generate uh, electrical power. Uh, and so then all of a sudden the oil business takes off. And what Rockefeller does is, is sort of totally different from other uh, guys. He, he has a company called Standard Oil of New Jersey. And uh, he eventually drops the New Jersey part of the name because nothing good ever comes out of New Jersey and no one wants to be reminded that it even exists. So he just abandons that and calls it Standard Oil. But what Rockefeller does is he uses the money that he has to buy competing oil companies and integrate them into his company. Uh, and he does it in a fairly ruthless way. Most oil companies are small and very local. So what Rockefeller would do was go to one of these companies and say, look, uh, sell me your company for $20,000. Uh, and of course they say, no, no, we do fine. We sell oil to local people, we do fine, no. So Rockefeller will build a store in your area and he will sell oil that is basically the same as your oil for say 25% less than you sell your oil for. Uh, and of course a couple of years go by and you go out of business, right? Because why am I gonna buy your oil when I can buy Rockefeller's for standard oil for 25? It's even called standard oil, right? Like it's the right, it's the right kind, it's the standard kind, which is a completely made up thing, but like it's named standard, right? Uh, and so then Rockefeller will come to you and say, look, sell me your business. I'll give you $5,000. And you say, well, wait a minute, a couple years ago you offered me 20. And Rockefeller will say, yeah, a couple years ago you were worth 20. Now you're worth five. Uh, and so you say yes, and Rockefeller pays you and says, I'm gonna buy your business, but what really is gonna happen is you're gonna do the thing you were always doing, right? Pump oil, refine it, barrel it up, sell it to people, and just send me a cut of the profits. Put my name on the oil, put my name on the, the can of standard oil now. Uh, and so he doesn't really integrate these businesses. He just puts his, his own label on them, right? He just buys them and makes them part of his company and then off you go, right? Uh, so all, after all, it's basically the same product. Anyway, these days, there's a huge amount of difference in various oil when they get refined, it all comes out kind of the same. Uh, that's because engines today are very, very, very high tech. In the 19th century, oil is pretty much oil. Uh, there's a huge difference, for example, in Venezuela today, they pump sweet crude, which is oil that has a high sulfur content. It's very different from what you get in Texas, it's called West Texas Intermediate, uh, or what they get in the Saudi Arabia, and the oil fields there. In the 19th century, it was like, whatever, it burns in a lamp, it's oil, who cares? Uh, so that was all Rockefeller cared about, right? It was just, all I want is for you to be working for me, not against me, and that's it, I don't care about details. And so there came a point in the 1890s where Rockefeller was able to say, with no hint of any kind of uh, alarm that uh, the era of the individual oil producer in America is over, uh, right? And what Rockefeller did say is, because I killed that guy, because I ran that guy to business, right? Because I, I staked him through the heart. Uh, and so there came a point where Rockefeller was selling like 80% of the oil in America was being sold by, by Rockefeller, right? And he was being sold by him. And so if that's the case, who sets the price of oil? He does, right? Uh, whatever he sells his oil for is the market price. If he decides to lower the price, everyone else will have to. If he decides to raise the price, everyone else will, have, will decide to do it too. Uh, and so he's the biggest oil producer in the United States of America. And in fact, the company that he founds goes on to become one of the biggest oil producers and exporters uh, in the world before it's broken up by the American government. Uh, and so, uh, and of course the uh, oil industry, the av availability of cheap oil makes the internal combustion engine Vital, right? So this is a great internal combustion engine, but if, if oil costs seven thousand dollars a barrel, it's not worth it, right? I'll just, I guess, I'll just go be like a steam engine. On the other hand, if Rockefeller lowers the price of oil to like ten dollars a barrel, oh my gosh, we go, we could get these and put wheels on them and have cars and put them in buildings and all kinds of other great stuff, right? Uh, and you know, God only knows what you can do with uh, electrical power, right? Uh, and so much like. Uh, Carnegie and Vanderbilt, uh, Rockefeller completely changes uh, the environment of the economy by introducing this, this completely new commodity, right? Now there's some the issues with Rockefeller. Uh, there's a senator, uh, his name is Nelson Aldrich. He's from, I wanna say he's from New England, Massachusetts, I think. Aldrich is this flinty, Yankee New Englander who is this sort of uh, unbelievably sort of self-possessed guy uh, and has these ideas that the government should not involve itself in business under any circumstances. Nobody, not everybody agrees with that. Guys like Vanderbilt and Carnegie, though, know, they really like the idea that maybe the government shouldn't tax them or regulate them in any way. So when Aldrich announces that he can't run for another term in the Senate because he's broke and they don't really pay senators a lot of money, he's got to support his family, uh, the companies step in and uh, set him up. Uh, the sugarcane companies, they really like him. They give him $100 million and a giant mansion that they bought for him. 
Uh, and so uh, years later, his daughter uh, married uh, Nelson, uh, John E. Rockefeller Jr., uh, Rockefeller's son. Uh, and Mark Twain covered the wedding for, I think it was like McClure's Magazine, and he said that the wedding took place in a house that Sugar built. Uh, right? Aldrich basically got bought off by the sugar companies. He, he was in the Senate for like another 25 years. Uh, they called him at one point the general manager of the United States of America because he was seen as being the guy sort of who made the government function, right? And today, would this be ethically questionable? Yeah, you, you can't be in the Senate regulating sugarcane companies when the sugarcane companies gave you $100 million. They just gave him a check. And they're like, well, would this help you not have to retire, right? How about a house for your family to live in, right? Uh, and so uh, when his daughter married uh, J.D. Rockefeller Jr., it symbolized for a lot of people what they saw as the very unhealthy alliance between the government uh, and big companies, right? Uh, and so Ida Tarbell, the great bump-breaking journalist, she covered this. She covered Rockefeller's shady dealings to get licenses uh, to drill for oil in land out west owned by the American government, right? Uh, they paid the government, in some cases, Rockefeller paid the government like a dollar per acre uh, to get onto land owned by the national parks and then drill there, uh, owned by the, the Department of the Interior, uh, which is, you know, a, a kind of a sweetheart deal. And of course, Rockefeller knew the right people and greased the right palms to make it happen, right? Uh, and so, uh, actually, Rockefeller's grandson, J.D. Rockefeller Jr.'s uh, son by Mrs. Aldridge uh, was Nelson Rockefeller, uh, who among other things will run for president uh, a couple of times, uh, be soundly defeated in the Republican primaries in 1964, and go on to serve as uh, vice president under Gerald Ford. Uh, and he got into the family business running uh, Rockefeller Center. That was the thing that they did, sort of, the, they farmed him out to that as a, as a young man. And so we'll talk about Nelson Rockefeller later, particularly in 1964 when he gets shouted off the stage at the Republican National Convention uh, in the middle of, of, a, of a near riot uh, by conservatives. Uh, but that was the grandson of J.D. Rockefeller, right? Uh, and so Rockefeller himself did engage in a lot of charity. Uh, he and his wife actually paid uh, to establish uh, the college that Martin Luther King went to, and they paid to support the college that Martin Luther King's wife went to in Atlanta, uh, Morehouse College and Spelman College. They, they, uh, they were funded in part by generous donations from the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, but again, there was always that sort of defensive edge to Rockefeller. He was a deeply, piously religious guy who was converted by his wife uh, to religion and to Christianity. And there was always the sense that Rockefeller was like, he was a good guy doing good stuff, but in public it sort of came off like he felt the need to do this to sort of burnish what people had as this horrible image of him, right? And in the early 20th century, the government went after Standard Oil. Uh, they alleged that it was a monopoly. Uh, and the Roosevelt administration, the Theodore Roosevelt administration, broke up Standard Oil into a series of small companies uh, that were obliged to compete against each other. Uh, and so there was a great picture on the cover of Collier's Magazine that showed Roosevelt rest, dressed as Hercules, wrestling Standard Oil. And all the Hydra heads of Standard Oil were the various managers of Rockefeller and Nelson Aldrich. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt is, is Hercules with like the club smashing, uh, smashing Standard Oil. And so, uh, ironically, of course, uh, some of these companies have since merged. Uh, a few years ago, it was in the 90s, uh, Exxon and Mobil became Exxon Mobil. Ironically, both Exxon and Mobil were parts of Standard Oil. Uh, and so they were split off by the government in the first decade of the 20th century, and they merged again in the 1990s. Uh, former Exxon Mobil CEO Rex Tillerson was the Secretary of State last year. Uh, and that was, that was where he got it. He was the guy that was the head of, I want to say, Exxon when they merged with Mobil. Uh, and became this sort of giant oil producing behemoth, right? Uh, and so uh, what Rockefeller brought though was cheap oil. And it's hard to argue if you live in America, you know that we live in a society that basically exists because of the cheap availability of gasoline, right? Cheap being in some cases a relative term, right? Uh, and so uh, that was that. And the other guy we could mention just very briefly uh, is uh, J.P. Morgan. This is uh, the dagger portrait of J.P. Morgan. Uh, this is, uh, it's called the dagger portrait because it, it looks like both from his facial expression and the picture that he's about to stab you with the dagger that he's holding in his hand. Uh, that's, that was J.P. Morgan's just expression. That was just the way that he looked. Uh, it's actually not a dagger, it's the arm of a chair. He's like, he's got his legs crossed and has his pant leg making a little blade there. It's just the like polished wood of the chair, right? It does look like he's yeah. gonna come for you, right? On the other hand, this is an actual photograph of, of Morgan. Uh, this is him about to assault a photographer with a cane in public on the street in New York City. And if you notice, the nose looks different in the picture. He had a, a, a the illness, a general problem with his nose where he grew cartilage in his nose and it looked like it was a boxer when he had a big cauliflower nose and bright red with uh, capillaries. You could fix that today with uh, surgery. They could go in and they could just cut the cartilage out and it's fine. Uh, obviously they couldn't do that in the 19 teens, right? Uh, and so he got this big, giant, bright red nose, and uh, in the portrait, the uh, the portrait artist just made the nose go away, and you just, you don't mention it. You know, he doesn't ask, you don't say, you just do it, and you get paid, and that's the way it goes, right? 
Uh, but Morgan didn't like photographs of himself, so he was about to hit this guy in the face. Uh, Morgan invented the bank. He realized that, uh, in his own words, banking is built on trust. You have to trust the bank's going to do what it says it's going to do, and you have to always do that. Uh, but he also realized that uh, there are lots of little banks. And little banks are fine, but the bigger the bank is, the more money it has, the more power all that money has. Bank ends up with an enormous pile of money that it can use to invest in things, it can lend it to businesses. You can do a lot of things with a pile of money. And the bigger your pile of money, a dollar isn't just a dollar. It acquires more and more and more power the bigger pile of dollars it's in, right? And so Morgan piled up as much money as he could get and started investing in other companies, particularly things like uh, Rockefeller's oil companies, uh, Vanderbilt's railroads, Carnegie Steel, uh, and he developed the largest bank in the United States, uh, J.P. Morgan. It's now called J.P. Morgan Chase, right? There came a point in the teens where there was an economic calamity in the United States of America, and Morgan got a call back from vacation, and he basically announced that he would bail out the American government with his own checkbook. He said that any business that fails or bank that fails, I will underwrite their failure with my own personal income uh, out of a check I write. Uh, and, he, and no, everybody believed he could do that because he had the money, right? And as a consequence, it's one of those things where guaranteeing that Morgan would bail out any bank meant that no bank needed to be bailed out. The guarantee was enough to save the banks. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but afterwards, of course, Morgan sort of somewhat dryly said to President Roosevelt, boy, it would be great if you know the government had a way to do this. And out of that came the Federal Reserve of New York. Uh, which was established to avoid that. Right now, the government can bail out banks to prevent them from failing without having to resort to guys like Morgan, right? Uh, necessarily. The irony, by the way, was that Morgan, uh, when he was on vacation, he had a deal worked out with his wife where uh, she was in New York and he was in Europe, uh, or they, or, she, or he was in New York and she was in Europe, and when one of them wanted to go where the other one was, they would send a telegram, and that way they could both leave and go to the other place at exactly the same time, and they would never have to be in the same room or even the same continent. Uh, right, so the closest Morgan would ever get to his wife was on, they would both be on steamships going the opposite direction across the Atlantic Ocean because she hated him so much and he hated her so much they didn't even want to be in the same continent, right? And so he would send a telegram saying, I think I'm going to come to, to Paris, and she would say, fine, I think I'll go back to New York and we'll leave on June 1st. Uh, and he got, he got called back to um, New York by Roosevelt and ended up having to take a room, a suite uh, on the Waldorf in New York City uh, and had to like publicize where it was going to be in the newspaper just so he wouldn't accidentally run into his wife who was also in New York City at the same time. Right? And so it was, they just had to work that out. Right? They, had a, they had a super great relationship, right? Uh, and so uh, the trick about these guys uh, is that they, they're not doing anything that no one's ever done. I, I mean, in some cases, okay, oil and like electricity and steel, they're not, businesses have always existed, but they're building these businesses that are bigger than anyone's ever seen, right? These are these are larger, they have more money, they have more influence than anyone's ever seen. Aldrich and the sugarcane companies is a great example, right? Uh, you could, I'm sure you would bribe senators in the 1780s and 90s, right? Of course you would, of course. Uh, the entire Reynolds affair involved uh, Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton and hush money being paid to uh, a, a woman's husband because he didn't, and Hamilton wanted to continue sleeping with his wife. Uh, that was a whole bank corruption scandal, and they worried when they, uh, Aaron Burr found out about it, he wanted to destroy Hamilton because he hated him. But also, there was actual concern that Hamilton was engaging in corruption. Right? Money, money was getting funneled out of the Treasury into Hamilton's bank account, and it was actually part of Hamilton's paycheck, right? so his wife wouldn't find out. Uh, so I'm sure, of course, there were corrupt senators and congressmen in the 1780s and 90s, there's no doubt. But the scale was just, it had to be, right? I mean, nobody's going to bribe, you know, Elbridge Gary from Massachusetts with $200 million because nobody has $200 million, right? But now, when you're Nelson Aldridge and you're reliably a pro-business vote in the Senate and you say you're going to retire, the sugarcane companies pass the hat and give you, you know, eight or nine figures. And they say, what if we paid you $100 million? And then you did you... Then you were in the center forever, uh, right? And so the political cartoon that usually you, you see to illustrate this um, is this one. It's called The Bosses of the Senate. Uh, and it's a bit hyperbolic, right? But this is a Senate by the monopolist, of the monopolist, for the monopolist. And here's all the senators in their desks, right? And then here's all the big companies, paper bag, uh, coal, sugar, iron, standard oil, copper, steel beam, nails, entrance for the monopolist. And then because, because we obviously have to really drive it home, you can see the entrance, the people's entrance over there in the corner locked, padlock shut, right? Uh, and so there you go. Uh, and so having said that, uh, people have a lot of real big worries about this. They worry that uh, we, when you have these companies that have this amount of money to throw around, there's really no telling what they could do, right? I mean, now you could go to you could go to a president, you could go to a senator, a congressman, a governor, and you could say, uh, you know, we, we don't want you to pass this particular law. Everybody in the state wants you to pass it, but we don't want you to pass it. What if we give you $100 million, right? What if we give you $30 million? What if we give you $50 million? 
Uh, that was not a thing that could have been done before, right? It's not to say that people were not corrupting before, it's just that the, the, the opportunity uh, was never there, right? Uh, and so uh, this situation.